big news. The Almanac is officially back. The most exhaustive and comprehensive guide to the 2023-24 college basketball season is available for pre-order now. If you go to cbbalmanac.com, link is in the description below, you can pre-order for just $15.99 or 20% off the sticker price. The format is going to be a little bit different this season. Instead of an 850-page PDF, you'll be getting access to the full site with league-by-league PDFs available for download. The preview will be live on September 20th. So you have until then to be able to get your pre-orders in. So for insight for all 362 Division I teams from their head coaches and the experts that cover them, make sure you hit that link. It's the Field of 68's off-season grades. And Rob Doster, when I'm in trouble, when things really just change, when I have a disheartening adjustment to make, you know the first phone call I make? Ed Cooley. Today, we're going to talk about the Georgetown Hoyas, your favorite if you followed Rob Doster on Twitter all summer. He's gotten many jokes off at Ed Cooley's expense, although they're kind of supporting Ed Cooley. We'll get to that. The point is Georgetown has a bunch of new faces. They have a completely new roster. Pretty much everybody's gone. That includes Primo Spears, Brandon Murray, Kudus Wahab, uh, and a bunch of other names. If you want to read them, there's a bunch of places you can read them. Returning, Jay Heath is back. 12 points a game last year. Uh, a cook, a cook is back. Other than that, a couple role players and then new faces that are in Rob. There's a bunch of them. Drew Fielder and Drew McKenna are in Supreme cook average 13 at Fairfield last year. Jade Knapps, Illinois point guard is now a Georgetown point guard. Dontra styles in from North Carolina. Ismail Massoud is in from Kansas state. He had some big moments in the NCAA tournament and Rowan Brumbaugh redshirted at Texas last year. He is now a Hoya it's an exciting time to be a Hoya fan. I'm sure they would tell you that themselves. But uh, how is it going to look basketball wise this year, Rob? It's you know the last two years, um, Georgetown combined to win a grand total of two Big East games. They've won 13 games in each of the last two seasons. And while I do think there is going to be uh, an improvement this year, I don't think that the improvement is going to be. Um, the jump from hiring Ed Cooley is not going to be felt immediately necessarily in year one. I think it's going to take a couple of years to get this thing going because of how bare uh, the cupboard was when Ed Cooley, um, when he walked in. Now, I do think we, we talked about this on the the Illinois podcast. I do think Jaden Epps is really, really good. Um, that is a really nice addition at the point guard spot. I think him and Rowan Brumbaugh together have a chance to be a really good backcourt in the Big East in a couple of years. Um, I think that Ishmael Masood is a guy that can be a very effective player in the Big East based off of the skill set that he has and the way that Ed Cooley can use him. Uh, Jay Heath, good player. A Cook Cook, if he's healthy, good player. Supreme Cook, if he's healthy, he could be a good player in the Big East, a guy that can get you like eight and eight on a given night, right? And I do think that the freshmen coming in have a chance to develop and be pretty good basketball players. So all things considered, like – The cupboard is not empty here. And the one thing that I will say is that I do really believe that Ed Cooley is a very, very good, like game to game coach. I think he's a very good uh, guy at kind of developing a culture and being able to get the best out of the group that he's put together. I think that he is someone that is, is a terrific game player that can find ways to exploit flaws in specific teams. Um, but to be able to do that and win consistently, like you got to have dudes, you got to have guys, you got to have players, you got to have your Bryce Hopkins and your Devin Carters. You got to have players that are at that level. And I just don't think that he has players that are at that level heading into the season. So uh, I think that it's going to be a, a fairly long year for the Georgetown Hoyas. Yeah, I, I I think they might, oddly enough, be okay with a long year as long as there's a jump, right? I'm, I, I'm not a Hoya fan. I can't put myself in the shoes of Hoya fans, but I can try. And they've been down bad. Let's just call it what it is. Like they, they haven't watched respectable basketball in such a long time that I think as long as there's a pulse, as long as there's a heartbeat, no matter how banged up this team is, that's going to be enough for, for optimism. And I think well, there, there, there's hope. Like that's the biggest thing that equally brings is like there's there's a reason to believe that you're trending in the right direction, right? Like yeah. it was just so you, you didn't win a game in 2022 in the Big East. You went 0 19 in the Big East if you were a Georgetown fan, and then they bring 
Patrick Ewing back after he didn't win a game in the Big East in his fifth year at the program. Like, I get it. It's Patrick yeah. Ewing. But at some point, like, you have to make the decision that the program is bigger than one guy. And I think it took them a year too long. I think that you saw it with how empty that Georgetown uh, home court was. The I don't even remember what the name of the building is. When I was there, it was the Verizon Center. It's not the Verizon Center anymore. Um, but I do think that there is some positivity there. And I do do believe that Ed Cooley is a guy that can kind of get the locals motivated a little bit. Now, what I'll say is this. I think that this is a harder job than anybody gives it credit for, right? And I've made this point before. Um, part of part of what makes great college basketball teams great is the ability to have a home court that is just an absolute and utter fortress, like Cameron Indoor Stadium, like Fog Allen Fieldhouse, right? Places where you walk in and you know you're not going to get a good whistle because the crowd is going to be absolutely insane. That's why when you see a guy like Chris Beard go to Texas, the way that he kind of tries to flip that program, get the fan buy-in. That's why you see Bruce Pearl do the stuff that he does when he's at Auburn, right? You got to be able to get that buy-in to the point that fans want to come to the games. It's fun to go to the games. It's a lot of the games and teams don't want to play there because they know it's going to be so rowdy. The officials are going to get intimidated and playing at Georgetown. One, you're playing in an NBA arena that fits 20 something thousand people when you're there's just no chance that you're going to be able to get that many people there two it's not on campus and there is no um public transportation to be able to get from georgetown to downtown dc there is no metro stop in in georgetown there's reasons that they did not build one there which we probably don't want to get into on a college basketball podcast but there is no metro stop in georgetown which means it's very very difficult to be able to get from one end of the city to the other end of the city. It's a pain in the ass. And they don't have a big enough on-campus facility. It, like Their on-campus facility is kind of like a glorified high school gym. So I bet the Mathis high school gym is better than what their on-campus facility is, even with after the renovations they put in. So I don't know how you develop that if you're Georgetown, right? I don't know how you're going to be able to make a building that sits 20-something thousand people feel like a home court when it's that much of a difficulty to be able to get the fans to go there so i think this is a it's 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 a long road i think this is like a two to four year process for ed cooley to get georgetown back to what we all want georgetown to be because let's be frank like georgetown when it's at its best is a very very good program that's nationally relevant in a way that not a lot of programs are nationally relevant yeah college basketball is better when georgetown is good i think everybody across the country would agree it I I actually look at this roster, like stepping back, the, the Ed Cooley stuff is one thing, where Georgetown's been, like there's excitement to add him, obviously, and you can talk for days about all he brings. Stepping back and just looking at this year's team and this roster, it reminds me of rosters that we've sort of kind of just shrugged off with Ed Cooley in the last four or five years that end up exceeding the sum of their parts, right? Like I I've come to associate Ed Cooley's teams with doing that year in and year out. And look, I am a fan of a program that almost hired Ed Cooley a few years ago. We ended up with Juwan Howard and not Ed Cooley. At the time, I was one of the most vocal, uh, I guess, anti-Ed Cooley people that you could be. I'm like, there is no resume of success here. Like his teams are always fine. They're not bad, but they're never great. And I do think like looking at the last three, four years, in my opinion, best su successful stretch of Ed Cooley's career, those teams all, I think, are remembered a little more fondly than how good they actually were. Like they've been fringe top 25 teams, but we're remembering them as if they were a little more. This roster to me is not a team that should sniff the top 25, but I won't be surprised if Ed Cooley miraculously has them winning games. Like I just won't. He keeps doing it. Um, the one thing I would say, I think that could have made this next year's team better. And I don't know how much control he had over this or not. I think there was a world where he brought some of his Providence guys with him to Georgetown. It didn't end up happening. Uh, it would have been a big boost for this team if he did, but you're laughing because you probably don't want to talk about that is my well, guess. No, no. Um, <laughs> can you just imagine the, the meltdown, the Providence, the Providence <laughs> fans already had a meltdown that like the coaching search went the way that every coaching search in America goes. Right. Yeah. Um, they already, they had a meltdown that a kid that committed to Ed Cooley when, or like was recruited by Ed Cooley when I was at Providence ended up committing to Ed Cooley. 
um, when he was at Georgetown, right? Like that's how it goes. You commit to a coaching staff, you don't commit to a program, right? Can you imagine the meltdown if he did what every coach in America does, which their new head coach, Kim English, did, brought three players with him? Imagine if he brought Devin Carter and Bryce Hopkins with him to Georgetown. They would have, Providence, Providence fans would have gone to Georgetown. They would have gone to the Ryzen Center and they would have burnt that thing to the ground if Ed Cooley did that. It was, <laughs> they, no, they absolutely would have, Rob. Um, it's a fun world to imagine, though. I'm not going to lie. Hey, we're sitting here doing our preseason uh, roster grades. We're not grading Providence. We're grading Georgetown today. So so there are reasons for that. Um, let's what's the expectation? Like, it, Can there even be an expectation for a team that's won so few games in the Big East the last two seasons? I mean, I would set the expectation at being competitive, right? I would set the expectation at one being better than DePaul. Like you don't want to finish below DePaul. Nobody wants to finish below DePaul. They're DePaul. Um, no, like I, I think that they can. Your point about the sum of the parts being better than um, than what like they are individually is is I think it's it's important with this group because if it all goes according to plan like I think they can get to like seven or eight wins in the Big East right like I I don't think that that's necessarily out of the question now are they going into UConn and beating UConn probably not but I think this is the kind of team that can like they could they could probably hang with Butler at home right I don't see anything about Seton Hall that makes me say that Georgetown can't hang around with them and beat them right so I don't think that this is something where you are looking at this group that they brought in and you say they they cannot be competitive, right? They they're gonna win three games in the Big East again. I think that if they went through three games in the Big East again, Ed Cooley would not have done a good job. I think that he can get to seven, eight wins, you know, schedule so that you can get to above five hundred on the season and start building some momentum for the future of this program. I think that's what you need to be able to do. I think that's completely reasonable. Um yeah, I'm I just like scrolling through teams, right? They're not going to be better than Marquette. They're not going to be better than UConn. They're not going to be better than Creighton. They're not going to be better than Zay. Like, there's a lot of top end talent and just competitive teams that have dreams of a Final Four in this conference. Well, but the, there the top is six in the Big East is is ridiculous, right? Like yeah. Providence and UConn are both going to be top five teams in America. At least in my mind, are both top five teams in America. I think Creighton yeah. is a top ten to twelve team in America. I think that. Villanova is a top 15 to 20 team in America. I think Providence, yeah. I think Providence is like borderline top 25, especially if Garway Duall ends up being as good as a lot of people think Garway Duall could end up being. I think Xavier is an NCAA tournament team. I think that St. John's is an NCAA tournament team, right? To me, there are seven teams in this conference that are going to be dancing when you look up in March. And if Georgetown can pick off one or two home games against them, right? And then they do what they got to do against DePaul and Butler and Seton Hall. Uh, yeah, DePaul, Butler, or Seton Hall. Like, then you're looking at like seven wins right there. And maybe you find a way to get an upset over one of those really good teams, which like it happens in every conference in America. That's eight wins right there. They can do that. That's not crazy. Is there a world where Georgetown is better than Providence next season? Uh, yes, there is. Okay. I mean, I'm just curious. I, I you, yeah. Yeah, you listed the Friars in there. I was just curious if that was like a no chance to you or if there was a chance. Um, I, I think it'd be very, it's very unlikely. But um, I mean, we've seen Ed Cooley outperform expectations. We've seen Kim English win 34 games and he's 34 years old, right? Like it just, I, I have, I have a, ve- I have very high expectations for what Kim can and will be as a coach. Haven't seen it yet. Does that make yeah. sense? A hundred percent. As far as my answer for expectations, this reckons back to my, I'm going back to my Michigan fandom here, but when they first hired John Beeline, there was a horrible season, right? Horrible seasons, won like 10 games. There was a lot of like, oh my God, we hired the wrong guy. Then that next year, he comes out with a team with zero expectations and rattled off back-to-back wins against top five Duke, top five UCLA and Madison Square Garden. Rest of the season didn't necessarily go as planned, but those two wins gave an entire fan base optimism that something was working. I think that's what Georgetown needs this season more so than like, Oh, it's going to be a failure if they don't finish sixth in the big East, they need to have a few moments against some of these elite teams. Cause they're going to have plenty of opportunities to pick off teams that are top 10 teams in the country. If Ed Cooley can do that once or twice, 
this season, then I think you know things are getting on the right track and you have a lot of hope for the future. Who is the X factor or what is the X factor for this Georgetown team? I mean, everything. Like literally <laughs> everything. Um, and I, we- I do think I do think that uh, getting – like Jay Heath is probably going to end up being the leading scorer for this group because Ed Cooley – when he, like his best teams have really good shot makers that can operate in ball screens and it kind of puts the ball in those guys' hands and let them rock, right? But I think for the long-term trajectory of what this program is, like let's see some flashes that Jaden Epps and Roland Brumbaugh can be one of the best backcourts in the Big East. Because I think that like Roland Brumbaugh is really, really good. Like He's got a chance to be um, a really good kind of possession point guard and he complements what Jaden Epps is pretty well right like Jaden Epps is more of a bucket getter and more of a guy that's a little bit more of a bulldog whereas Brumball is kind of like their uh facilitator passer um that kind of a thing like let, let's see signs that those two in two years could be all big east caliber players and if we see that to me like that I, I don't know if you really want to talk about x factors with teams that are would like if they make the NIT it'll be a good season right I think that what you want to see is those two dudes having big moments who's the best player on this team is it heath probably i was gonna say i was thinking about this earlier in the episode i'm like it might be jade naps and that that's making me backtrack everything like if if there's a world where jade naps is the best player on this team i'm kind of scared even though i like jade naps um I, i'm gonna go apps as the x factor just because i think there's such a wide range of outcomes like i think he could be a very good starting point guard in the big east immediately I think he could be nearly unplayable and a little bit of a head case who's expecting more than he can chew. Um, I I just don't know. And if he can be a solidifying, like, oh, no brainer, that dude's a three-year starter for the next three years of the the face of the beginning of Ed Cooley's tenure at Georgetown, then I'm buying this much more. So pressure's on. We'll see. Um, They have a lot of pieces individually that I like. Epps is probably the highest upside of them. And I don't know if that means good or bad things for this team in year one. What's the grade you give them? And I also want some rationale on how you're grading them. Because like, are we grading them on the coaching hire here too? I'm so confused on how to approach this. Yeah, I think you have to grade them on the coaching hire because that's uh, that's really all you can do at this point, right? And I would give them an A-. minus. You know, I don't think that you can... Uh, with all due respect to Patrick Ewing, I don't think that you could upgrade more than they upgraded. Um, I think that he brought in good pieces, um, and I think that they did a fair enough job kind of cleaning house from um, what was on that roster without uh, without getting to the point where like you completely gutted it down to the studs. So, uh, yeah, I, I would give it an A minus, and and ninety nine percent of that is just the fact that you have that coach on the sidelines now instead of the other guy. I'm just dying it with all due respect to Patrick Ewing. There is no larger upgrade than getting rid of Patrick Ewing. Uh, it does. It. I mean, it reminds me of uh, the upgrade that you made when you went from having me as a producer to Trevor Valise in a year. Like this is the largest upgrade since that. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna not include the hire here, and I'm gonna evaluate everything since Ed Cooley has been hired. Uh, I'm gonna give them a B. I still think like maybe maybe it's dirty. I don't care what you call it. I think he could have brought a couple Providence guys <laughs> with him, and then I would have loved this. Everything else, I think Ed Cooley's on the right track, and he's doing a good job. So, Hoyas, you get a beat from me. Uh, this is going to be a fun program to talk about. We are certainly going to continue talking about them all season long, and if you want to see everything that we're doing at the Field of 68, including the rest of our off-season grade series, you can do so on our YouTube channel, The Field of 68. Search us, click subscribe while you're over there. For Rob Doster, I'm Greg Waddell. We'll see you next time here on the Field of 68. Our partner for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 during the college basketball season, and I loved the impact that it had on my energy levels. I'm a big coffee in the morning guy, but by the time that the afternoon would hit, I needed another boost. AG1 helped me tremendously, especially on those days when I didn't want to get up off the couch and go hit the gym. Their tagline is AG1 is comprehensive health and the power of habit in one. And man, that could not be more 
true. It's nearly impossible to eat and drink in a healthy manner in the month of February and the month of March when you are in my business. And AG1 was exactly the supplement that I needed to improve my gut health and cover my nutritional bases for the day. I've continued that into April. I've continued that into May, and I'm going to continue that the rest of the summer. All I have to do is mix a scoop of AG1 with some water or maybe add it into a smoothie and I'm ready to go. Do it after lunch and you'll be ready to go for the rest of the day. If a comprehensive solution Solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com backslash field68. That's field68, F-I-E-L-D, the number six, the number eight, and you can get yours now. So check it out and help support this show. Thanks.